Hey, it's Andrew, and today on the show we have Azar Shad, Head of Growth at UserPilot. In today's episode, we discussed how Azar realized UserPilot had a churn issue as they were rapidly growing, the signals he uses to identify churn risk, and how he went about building the customer success team from zero. We also dive deep into the power of visualizing progress in the user onboarding phase and how transparency can be a tool to keep your customers engaged. As usual, I'm excited to hear what you think of this episode, and if you have any feedback, I would love to hear from you. You can email me directly on andrew at churn.fm. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, and enjoy the episode. How do you build a habit for product? You need to invest. And you saw these, these different... You don't just gun for revenue in the door. This is churn.fm, the podcast for subscription economy pros. Each week, we hear how the world's fastest growing companies are tackling churn and using retention to fuel their growth. How do you build a habit forming product? We crossed over that magic threshold to negative churn. You need to invest in customer success. It always comes down to, to retention and engagement. Completely bootstrap, profitable and growing. Strategies, tactics and ideas brought together to help your business thrive in the subscription economy. I'm your host, Andrew Michael. And here's today's episode. Hi, Ezra. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Andrew. It's a pleasure. Uh, for the listeners today, Ezra is the head of growth at UserPilot, and UserPilot helps product and customer success teams increase user adoption through a behavior-driven product experience layer, which is code-free. Uh, prior to UserPilot, Ezra was a founder of eComply and Leafaroo. So my first question for you, Ezra, is what makes UserPilot unique? And what is its big advantage for your customers? So UserPilot is, is a platform that helps all the product managers and customer success managers to do the onboarding at scale. And the, the reason why we are so unique and different is because we actually focus on context. So imagine if you are using, let's say, a Gmail and when you send a com- you compose an email and you send an, a, an email, Right after the email, if Gmail greets you to do and tell you to do something next. So based on the events, what they do inside the application, based on the actions, what they do inside the application, we, we tell the user to do what to do next. And that's something is powerful because if you know what the user does and you in the context, you tell them this is the next thing they should be doing is super helpful. And that makes us unique. So we, we, we are a huge fan of contextual onboarding where you exactly know who the user is, what they are doing, and then drive them to do certain thing next. You can think about it somebody, if somebody is a power user, perhaps the best thing to drive them towards is to make a referral. So based on the context inside the web app or application, you can drive them to certain action if that, that makes sense. And that's one thing. The second thing is like we, we, what we are doing is we are making creating the flows, the the thing that product managers use to make themselves by giving this opportunity to not code and do it directly in a very easy and simple way, simpler than what our competitors are currently doing. And that's something we really, that's that's something that our customers really like and that it's very easy to do and easy to implement it without even having so much of headache. There are already playbooks, templates there. They can just use it and directly go on the fly and start working and creating their, their onboarding flows, if that makes sense. So essentially what you're saying is that your contextual event-based uh, onboarding and product experience layer that sits on the product. And you allow this and make it easy for, whether it be the marketers working on the onboarding customer success or even product, to be able to go in and uh, create their own onboarding experience. And then this experience sits as a layer on top of their product or service, Am I correct? Exactly. Exactly. That's what the perfect way to summarize it. Cool. And uh, so I, I think this is definitely like uh, in terms of event-based uh, onboarding experience, it's, it's a critical thing that I think a lot of companies make a mistake with in the beginning is when they're thinking about, okay, so what do we want to teach our users now during onboarding? And then they'll go and set up a sequence of events that sort of just cookie cut one after the other and show maybe irrelevant messages to users even in the context. So what is your role then uh, as a, like it's head of growth, but we chat a little bit about, and I think you're in a new, unique position because you're heading up sales as well as success. So like, what is your function within the company? 
Yeah, so basically as a head of growth, uh, usually head of growth is a, is a good position after having a product market fit. I started the company very early and I was one of the first member in the founding team. So I just pick, pick a role that was head of growth, but basically I do everything. I lead three teams actually, marketing, sales and success. And eventually I, I find specialists who can later on take care of this. And that's my role. My role is to jump into either of the role and fix it and then come back and then uh, make it in a way that everybody can understand and then keep running the playbook. So I would say I was, if you have to give me one role, I would say I am basically taking care of the sales part and success comes later on because X is something I just started. Yeah. Very cool. And so I think like it sounds as well, like a relatively early stage uh, in the journey when it comes to churn and retention at user pilot specifically, what have you been focusing on? Have, is it something you've even started to look at yet or is it really predominantly like growth is the main focus at this point? Yeah, so I'm actually of the belief that you should have growth as, as you want to be rather than super hyper growth, at least initially, because the early growth, whatever it gives you, it gives you a lot of learning and you find out who's your actual customer, who's your ideal profile, who's actually buying from you. And so... My opinion is that we, 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 ex- we grew very explosively. So we grew like 40% month over month in 2019. And now we're trying to keep growing at least 20% every month. So growth is something that I deeply care about. But it's okay to be reduce some level of growth to actually optimize the, your own journey, optimize the, the different parts of funnel. So for example, so last year around in September, we actually like doubled down the growth number. And then the effect that we saw from there was we onboarded so many people who started paying us, but we did not take care of their customer success. We did not see that how many of these users are actually getting value out of user pilot. And that eventually hit us in the, in, in the month of, uh, in, in 2020, just like we, we, we saw that people who were not able to completely find the value started churning. And that's where my, my role came in. I, I found out that we are pulling a lot of people into funnel and making them subscriber, but we are not making them successful. So now my role is to actually take care of the success team as well. And so what we found out that in our in, in user pilot that everybody's pretty much motivated to use this tool and then get up and running, but not everybody has a knowledge to do it. So not everybody has an education how to use this tool and what to exactly measure inside the application. And that's, that's where my role comes. I try to go in there and try to fix the customer education part. So the first way I tried to fix the customer education part was to start having a product adoption school. So we now have a, we have a product adoption school where our users directly, when they come into the welcome email, when they sign up, we give them an opportunity to learn about product adoption school and it's free. They can just learn it. They get five emails. But that's one way we started doing it. Second thing we started doing to improve the customer education and reduce churn was going ahead and doing free webinars for every every user and try to reach out to them personally, regardless of where they are in the journey, to actually educate them about a free webinar that can tell tell them how to use a platform. Um, it's a live webinar. It it answers a lot of questions in the webinar as well. So that that's something we started doing it. And the third thing that we use user pilot for user pilot we went ahead and tried to figure out who among those users in the, in the, in, uh, who are paid users are actually not using user pilot enough. And this is something we, we connected to our customer success, which is feature adoption. And this is something that user pilot also helps with, but some of the users do not log back into the app. So what do you do? So what we did was we, we made a metrics where we found out how many users have actually, for example, in our application installation of JavaScript is important. So we found out how many have JavaScript installed. Then we try to figure out if they have JavaScript installed, how many of them are, have X number of flows or experiences. If they have less than them, then we try to actively reach out. Then we figure out, let's say in the metrics, like for example, if they are using checklist feature of user pilot. Checklist feature of user pilot is like the best feature out of all because it gets the user activated and, and it also increase their, the, the user to, to become a paid user as well. So we saw how many users are not using checklist so we can educate them on them. So we actually did the reverse engineering of whatever the users are not doing and that these are the key features they should be adopting with time. And what we did was we actively reached out to them and say, hey, I have a free UX training for you. 
that costs around X amount and um, we're happy to give you for free. There are a couple of suggestions. If you like, we can sit down with you and do, do actually flows. We can tell you how you can improve that. So these were the couple of things that I found out and in customer education because customer would just want to solve their one problem and they forget about that the, the same tool can help you with three or four other problems as well, which eventually increase whatever the metrics they are trying to optimize for. And that's where we, we came in and we said, hey, and now what we also do, just to understand in, in the whole flow, my customer success team and I also, as soon as somebody becomes paid customer, we ask them, how does the success look like for them? And that's very important. You know, you, you need to know what the user actually want to achieve. If they want to increase the trial to pay, if they want to reduce support tickets, if they want to scale their onboarding, if they want to educate the user contextually, whatever the goal is there, we try to optimize and tell the customer success team, hey, with over time, you need to make sure that these guys are successful in the pilot. We try to make sure, and with that, we also get more case studies, more reviews with that. So in short, like I, I, I told you three initiatives that are actually helping us to reduce churn. We already have very less churn. It's, it's, it's less than 2%, but we are even trying to reduce it because I think the user pilot is such a sticky tool. Nobody can just stop today and not do it. Um, and it's part of your actual business application. Yep. So you mentioned the three things that you've done to work on improving churn. I think the one thing I wanted to dive into a little bit deeper on was the concept you mentioned that you were growing month on month 40% and then all of a sudden you realized sort of that hyper growth had an impact on churn and you realized that you weren't doing a good enough job to onboard and educate your users efficiently. Do you want to walk me through that a little bit further? Sort of at what point did you realize churn was a problem? How did you realize it? I think sort of this, it feels like it's maybe the first time the company realized it was an infliction point. So talk us through like what the discussions were like internally. Yeah, so that's, that's very interesting, actually. I actually realized the fact when we, we, we started having the hyper growth at one point, nobody's taking care. So we did not have customer success like three months ago. So and then as soon as I saw the hyper growth, I said, many of the users are using the platform, but not using it enough. And the, the, the easiest way to, for us to check that is just look at paid users and see their last scene in user pilot. So when we see the last scene, they have never come back. I had this feeling already that we might see churn. And in order to do, in order to fix that, we, we were just like, we still wanted to increase MRR and not bother about churn. And we just delayed the problem as long as we could. But then shit hit the fan and then we figure, <laughs> figure out that it's something that we have to take care of now. And then we started doing these webinars and, and, and then we started and doing educational webinars. Educational content. Yeah. And so your product in terms of pricing, is it uh, monthly, yearly? Do you have both? Yeah, we have both actually. But we realized with the fact that the good customers who, you know, everybody is your ideal customer. So that's one thing. And we found out that a lot of customers were... Um, not using it for using user pilot for the right reasons. And so we, we, we now focus on customers who are low paying to move them to an annual plan just because it gives ample time to, to the user to explore it and not give up. And this is something that a lot of users do. Like they give up in the halfway without thinking, Hey, this didn't work because the tool is not good enough or I don't know about it, whatever the reason is. And what we saw that the one simple thing that we, 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 we saw in the pattern that a lot of users who were churning were actually low paying users who were initial users who did not value the platform as it, as it should be. And that's what we started also integrating the value of the platform while doing the demos, while doing the onboarding calls, while doing the webinars to keep delivering the value Although user pilot is pretty easy and self-explanatory, but the value comes in when you actually know what you do and how those numbers actually affect your onboarding or revenue numbers. And so we started delivering that as well. But yeah, I, I already knew this. Sometimes it's going to happen. We are having a lot of users without even some, some, sometimes we didn't even talk to them. They were just self-serve. But slowly it, it felt like it, it's the right time. And I think we still have the, it, it under control. The churn is under control. The only thing is we have to figure it out. How can we make it sure that every user is in our paid subscription utilizing the user pilot the way they used to be? And so this is right now we're currently optimizing for. Yeah. And then you offer a free trial you mentioned as well. So yeah. What is the period of the free trial? 
So our period of free trial is 14 days. Okay. And usually, so if you look at our website, it's, it's a, a book a demo button, it's a get a demo button there. And so whoever goes through the, the basic get a demo button, they, 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 they get a demo and then, then we have a 14 day free trial where we intensively work with those users and then try to make sure that, that they, they convert. But now we, since last eight months, we also have a free trial button, which is kind of hidden. And we just wanted to still control our pipeline. So we gave two options. Whoever figures out on the header, they can get a free trial as well. And uh, in that free trial, we figured out that the free trial customers are turning more just because they did not understand the value more. So we, yeah. we're going to go completely free trial and remove the get a demo button, but because we are product led and we want to be product led, but right now it's, it's good time to optimize it. Okay. Uh, so it feels as well like you're adding a little bit of friction to the sign up uh, purposely to make sure that you can get that good user education in before they start using the product or service. Yes. Uh, the thing as well then is like 14 days. I think uh, it sounds like it might not even be enough time for a solution like yours in the sense that like you're providing this whole user onboarding experience for them. So 14 days almost feels like an unrealistic amount of time yeah. for somebody to come in, start using your product and then be happy and sure that it's right for them before having to purchase. Is this something you've considered yeah. considering like what are you doing about this? Yeah. So whoever comes to the free trial and doesn't talk to the salesperson, we give them a 14 day free trial and whoever goes to the salesperson actually gets an extended free trial. So we initially tell them 14 days, but we already told, tell them in the demo call that they will get an extension if they want. And this is just since like a bootstrap company, we are optimizing for revenue right now. It, it made sense for us to have a 20 days of trial but not, not promise for like, if we give them 28 days instead of, or 30 days or instead of 14 days, the user will be lazy to actually not do it till 30 days. But if the user says, Hey, I need an extension. We're happy to give them an extension because we know that they have actually made an effort. So short answer is that it should be 30 days or it should be even, I don't know, freemium, but what makes sense for us right now as, as, as a company that is self-funded, to extend them if they want and always be, be helpful to, to make it, make them even for 30 days if they want, and then ask them if they're happy and ready to become a paid subscriber. If that makes sense. Yeah, I think definitely, like you say, you're optimizing to, for revenue as a startup. It helps. I think going full freemium too early as well is uh, a bit more challenging uh, in that sense, if you're really optimizing uh, for early stage revenue. Uh, and a product like yours. I think definitely what you mentioned though, in terms of sort of like a value-based pricing when it comes to on usage, it could be a good way and good model for full freemium in the sense that allowing users to be able to create their onboarding experience and then uh, when they actually start getting traction and can afford to pay for your product, then that's when you start charging. And it definitely aligns as well quite nicely with the natural usage and also with expansion. Because I think looking at your pricing strategy at the moment, it feels like potentially at some point you might need to look into other alternative routes for expansion as well. So it's currently it's 149 yeah. per month billed annually. Yeah. Does yeah. that change depending on the number of users you have or? Yeah, yeah, it yeah. changes based on number of monthly active users. We do see that there is a, so initially all the users who come in, they start with their testing server. Yeah. And then they move that they try to expand it. We see that like, at, I think five or 4% of the users are actually upgrading later on because they're still testing. And then when they go live, then they're showing it to everybody. And then, then the customer success comes in and then says they try to expand offer them something much discounted to so make them feel much, much, much important as well because they were with us and yeah. offer them something of value by upgrading them at the same time. For sure. All right. So, and then talking about customer success now, you mentioned that during this phase of growth, you realize, okay, now we need to really be investing in customer success. What was your strategy going into this? Like you mentioned your sort of role as well as to come in, figure out a problem, create a playbook and then hire the team. What was the playbook that you came up for customer success at user pilot? And how did you go about figuring out what that uh, should look like? Yeah, the very interesting question, actually. So we recently issued like have a complete feature of NPS net promoter score. Um, and people can use it on user pilot. So we essentially are an in-app experience tool. And so one of the things in-app is NPS. 
And what I started doing was like I put our own NPS and our own tool and, and then started collecting the NPS score. And what I started optimizing it for were people who are promoters and people who are detractors. So people who are not giving a good, good score and people who are giving us good score. And based on the score, if they say above eight out of 10, then I'm trying to reach out to them and try to make the case study out of them and give, ask for a review, tell them why they love us. That was a good part. But people who even more urgent and more, more important was people who were not happy. And um, just putting that NPS score gave us a bit of idea how people are using user pilot and why they're ha- unhappy. Uh, so that's one thing we try to fix that by just getting the score and we, that, that score did improve for the user who gave us the score. That's one thing. So that was the lowest hanging fruit for us. Yeah. And then once we figured out NPS score feedback, what we did was we again went ahead and looked at users who are not. So one thing is, was a big alarming for me initially while I was using user pilot in user pilot to figure out that um, a lot of users. So one of the key actions in our application is to install the JavaScript. And I saw a lot of users initially who are paid users, but not had they have not installed the application and they're just paying us every month. And this was a big alarming, like, this is a danger zone customer who's paying us, but has not installed it. So one thing I did was I, I immediately reached out by offering them a free help, say, hey, I'm happy to help you with the installation if you need. Uh, if there's any query from your developers, we're happy to help you. I have a developer development team that can help you out as well. So just giving them extended offer uh, because those users should be doing it or maybe tra- just trying to find out why they haven't installed it or when they will install it. So these were the initial I would say reflex reaction to, to those specific uh, problems. And then if that was fixed, then as I said, I, I went ahead and made the, made the entire chart in user pilot by looking at what events they have done inside the application and what events they have not done. And based yeah. on that, I just started dividing them. And then once I had the list, I knew that who are the people who are not active, they, they, even in user pilot success metrics, so we have a success metric. If the flow, the user has clicked on the on the flow if the user has um, seen clicked and then completed the flow and looking at the metrics if there's a good engagement and good completion gives us the idea that a lot of users inside our application are getting value out of it and then some of the users immediately just click on the upgrade button by the annual one as soon as they find these metrics are working for them but some of the users were not so this is a key success metric for us and our users that we both agree on that, that this is something that, that's providing them the value. And that's what I started optimizing it for. I found out people who are who have low engagement and low completion to improve them into better completion rate and better engagement rate. And one more thing, since we use also checklist uh, and a lot of users are using checklist, some of the things are a little bit psychological in there as well. So for example, there's an effect called Zagranic effect where you make the first task dummy and tell them it's already done. So user is more motivated to finish the checklist. And this simple, this simple effect can in, increase the conversion of, or maybe increase the user activation as well. And I found out that a lot of users were not using that psychological tricks. So I just made a small video and said, hey, this is a suggestion for you. Perhaps if you put this, this dummy psychological cue on your application, you will have more, m- more people converting. So that, that was one, w- one good response. And the second thing which we found out was that a lot of users were using like checklists with like 10 tasks. Whereas I recommend users using checklists for, for example, a checklist feature with, if instead of doing 10 tasks divided into five and five, so user is much more likely to convert. So I saw that a lot of people were having more completion and more engagement just because they divided the checklist into two, two different checklists. So one after the other. So the user is more likely to finish it. And that also improved. So just looking at their success metrics and which is aligned to our success metric actually improves the, the user attention from our end as well. It's a lot of hard work. You have to go in each account and see it, but I think this is the job of customer success guys to to yeah. every day and look at and make sure it's working out. Yeah. So you went through quite a lot. I want to just backtrack a little bit to a couple of things. First one, we'll get started with uh, this point now that you mentioned, because I don't think we explained it clearly enough earlier as well in terms of checklists, what you mean by that. And uh, so just correct me if I'm wrong, but what you're saying essentially is you're providing uh, sort of key tasks, a list that users uh, of an application need to complete or do in their onboarding process. And you provide uh, either it's a widget or an 
an embed that allows the end users to see what they still need to do or complete in order to complete the onboarding. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. Sorry about that. So checklist is our is our is our key feature. It's a widget that sits on top of your user interface and tells the user to finish these three to four or five tasks. Yes, absolutely. And then what you mentioned as well was sort of like giving that psychological trigger or sort of motivation to show that you've completed step one or five or whatever, sort of when you say dummy task or what was it in your case, like uh, what was the number one of five or whatever the number was that you can, I don't know the exact number, but the first one you said should be a, a dummy one, one that's already been completed by the user. What was that in your case? Oh, in our case is account created. So as soon as they come in, uh, usually this is for everybody, whoever is, uh, is onboarding new users, yep. the dummy task is account created as simple as that. And, and this specific sort of uh, insight or tip that you give to your users, well, is there any data behind it that you've seen like from all your users? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and what is that exactly? So basically uh, one of my users has a very low completion checklist uh, because he's not attracting the right users right now, but uh, the completion rate is around 3%, which is way below. But then when I recommended him to have at least two different checklists or, and also add this dummy task, the 3% went to 6% and he almost doubled his completion rate. And uh, that was something that was very interesting for us so usually a checklist completion rate for us is around 30 percent but that customer was already struggling to com- let the user complete 33 percent of the u- user so the one advice helped him to activate it more users just by having that one optimization and that's something that that's a role of customer success to just go in there and see what the users uh, our users are doing with our application what flows you're creating and what checklists you're creating, just go in there and tell them, hey, maybe you can optimize this specific thing. So checklist was one. Checklist was one way to do it. But there are other users who are sometimes inside the application, they have a product tour. And product tour is something that we do not recommend because a product tour is more educational rather than more interactive. It's, it is it might be interactive, but it's not making the user to find the aha. So you know every every software has this superpower and the superpower could be increasing the, the willingness to pay, increase um, the reduce the time, save costs, stuff like that. So these these are the value metric as software does, you know. It optimizes your productivity as well. And those are the features that that are aha features. And with product tour, you can't do that. With product tour, you just educate them about a button. With interactive walkthrough, when we, we when we when we suggest them to use interactive walkthrough, it takes them to aha much quicker because they click on it. And this is something is a very small, it just changes the entire way of making the user aha consistently. And that's where the retention of the user and end user retention also increases. And this is something we recommend to our, use, our own customers to use it. And if we look at their flows and if they're making this mistake, we go in there and we do suggest them to how to optimize this, if that makes sense. Yeah. So it's just on the product tour aspect, it's like a lot of companies will... Uh, guide you through step by step of uh, here's how you uh, create a tool here's how you view a report for example but what you're saying is they're not very reactional contextual and switching more towards sort of this educational contextual based uh, onboarding process where you can actually guide a user to the aha moment that moment where they experience the first point of value that your product delivers and then really even celebrate that moment with them. So I think obviously this is something that everybody talks about over and over again is really trying to get your users to that point of value, the reason that they signed up for your tool to begin with. And what you're saying with contextual sort of onboarding, uh, you can actually guide them to that point and then celebrate that point with them. Yes, yes. Absolutely. So the question as well I asked previously, I think the in terms of like you making suggestions and giving your customers tips, so telling them to start off with an already completed. So in your case, a user pilot, you have account created being the first tip. Uh, is there sort of any data that you've seen now with, with your customers, with a large number of customers where customers that implement this data, this dummy sort of first checklist uh, item versus those that don't has that impacted completion overall or it's only really antidotal that you have with this first customer that went from three to six percent so three to six percent customer was somebody i was closely looking at so 
we our, our normal checklist completion was around 25 uh, percent without that account created what we did was we we did not have that account created and then we added account created and that improved to 35 percent just like again the same same zagranic effect helped us as well i do not have a specific customer right in my mind who i suggested and improved it but i know my numbers so i can tell you this actually helped us already yeah now and i'm asking again just because it is an interesting concept it's something definitely that comes up in gamification frameworks quite a bit yeah and is that sort of uh, level of completion and feeling of accomplishment and you wanting to sort of guide your users through the process so they feel like they've invested time and energy as well into your product or service so it's they're not starting from scratch they've really done something and something yeah yeah and this is not just used by us like we we, we have not introduced this oh, Cora is using this linkedin is using it everybody's using this it's just that we as b2b SaaS companies so our typical customer when they come in they think that confirming an email is act as as an activation point and yeah. that's something which is not an activation point right so that's what we try to optimize it to tell them hey what is opt- what is an activation and how we can imp- increase the activation by the different U- ux and ui patterns yeah uh, and then in the school that you have like you mentioned activation point now as well in the product adoption school what are you guiding through your users through like what are you teaching them in this course so in this course we have like five lessons and each lesson is based on the practical examples that we have but the first thing we, we actually tell our users to before even using something like user pilot they should have something analytics already in place for example full story or hot jar to actually see where the users are stopping so that's lesson number one the lesson number two mostly focuses on okay now you have gotten understand like okay where exactly the drop off is happening go in there and figure out what is your activation metric. And then the activation metric could be something where the users not only get, get the aha, what the application does, but the user activation as well and figure out not only what the app does, but also how it is helping me right now by just clicking on those buttons. So we try to optimize them for their activation moment. And once the activation moment is done, we try to teach them how they can think about secondary features. For example, again, if you give Gmail example, you say send a message, it was one feature, but attaching a, a document is a secondary feature. Sending a snooze button is, is a secondary feature. So like once you have done the basic onboarding, how you can consistently think about it in the, in the user journey, what are the secondary features they should be exposed to in the next 30 days? And that's what we try to educate them in product adoption school. We try to tell them to iterate it because onboarding is not a one-time process but rather keep iterating, A-B testing it, what's working and what's not working, if that helps. Yes, it does. And then in terms of sort of product adoption, I think this is something that's often a very like sort of lost opportunity in the sense that uh, we see like product announcements and product updates as, as once off, as a binary. So we send out an email, we create an ad campaign, and then it's totally forgotten about afterwards and we're relying on like our users seeing that one email or seeing an ad campaign for a new product or feature and existing customers might not even be realizing that changes are happening within the product. So in terms of product adoption and like you said, it's a constantly evolving thing that you need to be working on. How are companies and what are some smart things you see companies doing when it comes to product adoption to once say they've got through the activation phase and they've done their onboarding, like how are you consistently engaging with users, ensuring uh, they're trying new things and they're moving as any interesting things you're doing at user pilot or anything interesting you've seen your customers using the product for? Yeah, yeah, very interesting question. So product adoption is something, again, you were completely right that when they send an email and they send the ad and then show that this is the feature we have, but they don't think about the existing customer. The, the way people use user pilot is three different use cases in terms of product adoption. Actually, for the, f- the first one, I already explained that you need to consistently onboard them. So you pass a custom feature and wait for, let's say, 10 days and say, hey, now if the user has not done this, show them this specific slide out and onboard them into that specific button. So that's one, w- one use case which we focus a lot on in user pilot to show them something is user is not doing and then tell them wait for certain days once they're onboarded. So that's one use case. The other use case is minor release. And this is what we also really focus on. So minor release is something that you keep 
keep changing, keep happening, but it's not big enough to actually go in there and explain the user a lot about it. And you don't want to disrupt the even experience. So there we suggest to use a little hotspot with a tooltip, tell them, hey, this is a new feature. If you want to play with it, go ahead and play with it. This is the feature that we recently released. That's one. Then there is a, ma a major release, which could be like, you know, when, for example, I remember when uh, Drift uh, introduced the Drift video, they had a huge release on their own event there. But I also, as a Drift user, got a huge pop-up on my face saying that, um, hey, we released the feature, would you like to try it? And then and I tried the Drift feature. And that's where we suggest to use like some kind of a model, get their attention, make the backdrop lighter. And so make the existing user adopt certain features or adopt new features a new product event by showing these releases to the user and taking them to that specific button or page or wherever they want to be. And we have seen so many users when they figure out these specific new releases, engaging with those features, as well as finding more value out of the software. You know, like the more you, you the more they are showing the updates, the more that they think, uh, at least the end user think that the company is making progress. And that progress increases the retention because the user is now using more features and he's hooked up. So I, as me, myself, I was a Drift user. I was just using Drift chat. Then I started using Drift bot. And now I started using Drift video. It's totally hard for me to get out of this Drift ecosystem now. So I think this is what we should optimize for as customers, as a retention specialist, I would say, to keep adding those releases and keep it in front of our customers to figure it out. One other thing that other companies do really well is that whenever you have a new feature, you put it on your login page. So your new users actually see new, your existing users see the new release on your login page. I think that's a smart way to do it. Drip does it, Drift does it, which users can already start utilizing it by just get, it's like, you know, whenever you come back to the same door and you say, hey, we have something new. And I think a lot of you companies, SaaS companies do not think in that sense where we should start optimizing, not just thinking in terms of ads or emails, rather thinking about when they come inside the door, which is your own application, how you can greet them in a way that they can understand this. Yeah, and I think another very big missed opportunity as well is the homepage of most startups because uh, it's often like a very, very big place and very big traffic sources, existing users coming to log into the app. So having that as an entry point and like you said, just like the same way you're using the login page is actually using the homepage to push a sent in front new features or new products to users. So having a different experience for users that are logged in that arrive on the homepage versus uh, just casual visitors to the site. So definitely a good way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a question I want to ask as well, then I'll ask everybody on the show is let's imagine you join a new company and trainer retention is not doing great. You've been given three months to turn things around and you've been asked to try and like lead the initiatives at the company. What would you be doing in those first 90 days uh, to try and get some results for the company? Mm, okay. So first of all, if there is an analytics setup, I will start just diving deep into analytics and seeing what users, successful users are doing and what unsuccessful users are doing. That would be my first first go to point i will see all the user recordings if there's full story hot jar kind of an application there which is already installed especially when the new users are coming in and especially when the old users are coming in so i will spend a lot of time before even going to the user and just looking at the analytics and see where this, this drop off and where the users are not converting into the next step so that's the first part the second part i would i would do is like once i figured out who are the unsuccessful users and successful users and try to do interview with them both and try to incentivize those interviews as well because a lot of users when they say hey can you talk to us we're spending time with them so maybe i can incentivize by saying hey 25 dollar amazon voucher to just talk to us and tell us i will also look at churned users as well right so people who left and why did they leave and what was the specific reason and try to find a pattern there and once i figured out that the, the reason from Successful users, unsuccessful users, and from churned users, I would try to optimize for those points where I found out that things are not going good. And I'm pretty sure when you do this three different kind of users who you look at, I'm 100% sure that you will find pattern to optimize churn and reduce it as much as you can possible. Cool. And then one last question I wanted to ask you is like, 
what's one thing, one unique approach to tackling churn retention that you think um, you've uh, learned over the years and you think other companies just should be trying more of? Mm, uh, very interesting question. Yeah, so I, I, it's, one, it's, it's just one strategy the thing that always work is that you need to follow a, a customer and be close to the customer from trial to pay to power user. And um, I myself, I, I'm very close to the customer myself by talking to them every day and listening to their, to their, to the challenges and problems they're solving. What I think is that this is what the other gurus of SaaS also say that if whoever wins, whoever, every, anybody who's closer to the customer wins. So that would be one thing that I would suggest to keep, be close to the customer. You're making product for them. You're making uh, them successful. Your, your SaaS is actually there to make them successful. So if they are successful, then you're successful. So just be close to them. And that's what I keep also trying to optimize for myself as well. I, I try to at least have like one um, interview per week, regardless of it's a uh, um, paid user or non-paid user, just talk to them and figure out what's, what's not working for them. And Try to try to understand them, and the more you understand them, the better it gets. Yeah, the closer you get to the customer, is the one who wins. So uh, I think that's it for today. Azar, is there anything you'd like to leave the listeners with before we go for the day? How can they keep up to speed with what you're doing at User Pilot? Yeah, so we recently launched a report. It's a very interesting report. Recently we launched. It's called SaaS Product Onboarding: The State of SaaS in 2020. The State of SaaS Product Onboarding in 2020. And you can just go to userpilot.com slash sash dash product dash onboarding. And this is a report we recently released and we figured out that a lot of companies, SaaS companies, we, we like research thousand SaaS companies. They found out that out of thousand SaaS companies, 40% of them do not even have their welcome screen, which means that they are not greeting the users when they come in. We also found out that a lot of companies are are, have a lot of friction, so they still ask you for email confirmation while doing the sign up. So these are two big mistakes they do. And the third big mistake was that the in app was not connected to out app. So for example, the users who were inside the application doing something, they didn't get an email of something to take them to the next journey. And this is something that I would recommend. I would definitely suggest you to look that report out. It's currently very much popular right now. Everybody found some mind boggling uh, stats that, that, that also made them wonder. So I just suggest you to check that out. Excellent. Well, thanks very much. I wish you now best of luck going forward with the, the roles and as you start transitioning from a different phase to phase now, best of luck going forward. Thank you so much, Andrew. It was nice having, nice being here. Thank you. And that's a wrap for the show today with me, Andrew Michael. I really hope you enjoyed it and you're able to pull out something valuable for your business. To keep up to date with Churn.fm and be notified about new episodes, blog posts, and more, subscribe to our mailing list by visiting churn.fm. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you have any feedback, good or bad, I would love to hear from you. And you can provide your blunt, direct feedback by sending it to andrew at churn.fm. Lastly, but most importantly, if you enjoyed this episode, please share it and leave a review as it really helps get the word out and grow the community. Thanks again for listening. See you again next week.